Amen. Amen. You know, every time I get an opportunity to stand behind this pulpit, it seems like pastor preaches my message, and uh, there's not so much left to say. But that's good. That uh, helps me to, to know that I'm in the will of God, and uh, that we're not here by mistake, and we're not here by coincidence, and the words that are spoken tonight are from God. Before we go before the Lord in, in prayer, or in word, let's go before the Lord in prayer this, this night. I won't try to keep you long. And if it's okay, I know that the typical pastor is to preach really hard, and I feel a sermon coming on, if you will, if that's okay. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father. God, we recognize that you are omnipresent, Lord, that you fill all space. But, God, we pray right now, and we extend unto you a special welcome, Lord. We thank you for your presence in this place. Now open our minds and our hearts to receive your word. We welcome you into our hearts right now, God. Lord, when our ears are supposed to be open tonight, Lord, let them be open to the fullness of the word that you have for us tonight. God, let us leave this place changed, Lord, more aware of our surroundings, God, more aware of the fight that we are in day in and day out, that we be not deceived by the rudiments of this world, Lord, but that we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony, Lord, the testimony, God, that we strove to the end, Lord, to reach out to you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. If you would open your Bibles with me tonight. To Jeremiah chapter 6, we're going to be reading from verse 14 to verse 16. For the sake of time, I'll go ahead and read it. I'm reading from the Amplified tonight. They have treated superficially the bloody broken wound of my people, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Were they ashamed because they had committed disgusting and vile things? No, they were not at all ashamed. They did not even know how to blush at their idolatry. Therefore, they will fall among those who fall. At the time that I punish them, they will be overthrown, says the Lord. And this is the verse that I want us to key in and focus on tonight. Thus says the Lord, stand by the roads and look. Ask for the ancient paths where the good way is, and then walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. When Jeremiah preached this message, the, the Bible says they told him, we will not walk in it. And it's not just, we will not walk in that. It was, we will not walk in what you have to say. It was very forceful. It was with exclamation. They had found, you may be seated, they had found their truth. They had found what made them profitable in their own eyes. They had strayed so far off course, strayed so far from the, originals, from the original journey that God had placed them on to a point where they realized in themselves that they had no need for God. They had no need for the offense of the word of the Lord as it is to our flesh. They had no time and would give no ear to it. And they would not walk in the paths that God had asked them to walk. They did not even know how to blush at their indiscretions. They did not even know what shame was and what it was and when it was to be felt in their lives. Beyond the disgusting and vile things, they looked upon a world that was falling and decaying rapidly. And they screamed out, even the priest... Even the pastors and the preachers of the time, they screamed out, there is peace on earth. There is peace here. We hear the same unity cry out from our, from our government, right. screaming out in the midst of chaos, there is peace and there is unity. Right. If you believe in what we believe in, you will be okay. Right. Today I was, I was in a commander's call and, and they had said, if you had received the vaccination, you may take off your mask. If you have not, then you will continue to wear your mask. And it is like as if you believe in what I believe in, then everything is unity and everything is peace. 
But the moment you dissent, the moment you show backbone, the moment you show Christian character, it feels as though sometimes I find myself retreating into the darkness, retreating into the corners, wanting not to be seen by the world because I know that, 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 that the confusion that is wrought in this world will come against me and make me feel small. Make me feel like I'm on the losing side. This is not new to the church. This is not new to the man of God experience, to the woman of God experience. David said, why art thou disquieted within me? Why art thou cast down on my soul and why art thou disquieted? Why are you raging inside of me? But he had to say, hope, my hope is in God. My hope is in the future that I have with him and not the future that I have with this world. They have treated superficially the wounds, the brokenness of my people saying there is peace, there's healing. They led astray so many people and, these, and imagine living in a world. It does not take that much to imagine living in a world that Jeremiah lived in. When we see the Christian morality and the Christian values retreating under the word tolerance and churches in the greater pale of Christendom retreating and, and, and acquiescing to and conceding ground to the world, they don't even realize what they are doing. They don't even realize that there comes a day when there will be a reckoning and God will overthrow them. And God issues out a proclamation to us tonight as he did thousands of years ago through the prophet Jeremiah. And he says, stand by the roads and look. Ask your pastor for the ancient paths. Where is the good way? And then walk in it. How many people know what the good way is but fail to walk therein? How many people ask for the ancient paths but do not look to see if what they're being fed is actually what is truth and what is real? We live in a world that is overwhelmingly vying for all of our time, all of our finances, all of our, all of our, all of our attention. And if we're not careful, we will find ourselves conceding ground to the enemy in our own lives. My wife asked me tonight if I had a story to tell, and I couldn't think of one until re really late. You know, there was a professional football player. He played well before I was born in the 1960s. His name was Jim Marshall. You might remember him because he became a f part of folklore and, and football in the NFL. He caused a fumble. He picked the fumble up and then proceeded to run as fast as he could, 60 yards into the touchdown of the opponents, of the opponents' touchdown. He, 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 he ran it all the way and scored for the other team a two-point touchback. And with all kinds of excitement and gusto and, and everything, he takes that football and once he runs across that line and he spikes it into the ground, begins to celebrate and the crowd is just booing him like crazy. What was meant to be a pivotal moment in the game, what was meant to be a tide-turning event, turned into something so horrible and wretched. Luckily for him and his legacy, he, he saved face at the end of the game by causing the, the uh, quarterback to fumble the ball and his teammate picked it up and brought it to the right touchdown. And they scored. None of us are professional athletes but we have oftentimes and will oftentimes find ourselves heading in the wrong direction. With every bit of Christian strength and, 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 and spiritual power that we can muster up, thinking that we are in the right way, in the good path, in the ancient way, but not looking to see that the closer we get, we're getting closer to the enemy and further away from what God wants us to be. This is especially true in our faith. The enemy of our souls, we have to respect as a master deceiver. When you lose respect for the enemy, you lose the battle. When you lose respect for the enemy, it is doomsday for you. 
We cannot lose respect for the fact that he is a master deceiver. And every day we wake up in the morning, or, or I can't speak for you, but I wake up in the morning and sometimes I neglect to realize I'm going onto a battlefield. I'm going onto a spiritual battlefield that is warring against my soul and against the family that I'm here to raise. I love what you said about being a man. This world today is trying to sissify men. This world today is trying to, to reach this idea of my truth. And I've never seen or I've never been so fearful for our country than I am right now. And I'm not here to preach a doomsday message because in the end we know we win. If we stay the path, if we continue to walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. But it is scary to see the parallel the, the, the parallels that we have, and I, I'm, a, I'm a student of history. I remember studying up on, on Greece and, 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 and Alexander the Great. Those things fascinated me, the things that happened in between the 400 years of, of, of the Old Testament and the New Testament. And Alexander the Great conquered the world, just like the United States has conquered the world. Standing on top, no one can touch them. When he died, three generals stood about his, about his bedside and, said, and asked him the question, who is going to take over for you? And he said, the strongest among you. He didn't point at one of them and, and, and name a successor. He said, the strongest among you, because he knew that what they were going to do after that was fight the hardest that they've ever fought in their lives to make sure that everything that he had paved the, the way for would continue. And they did. They fought and they continued to lead the world until their men became sissified philosophers. Until the strength and the backbone of their men became all about philosophy. And Paul, he descri or Luke describes Paul's experience in the book of Acts. I believe it's chapter 21 when he says that all they wanted to do was to know more and new things. And they were in a search for truth. And one thing is universally true that this world be, that this world would tell you is not true is that God made us. He made men to create. He made us with imaginations and to be able to create and we can create and achieve just about anything there is. The only thing that we cannot create that I can think of is truth. There is no creation of truth and in our and in our and in our attempts to create truth we always create a lie and we propel that lie out there and this world today I'm here to discover I'm here to uncover rather the lies that the world is telling our young people that you can have your own truth there is no your own truth if you have a truth that is your own it is a lie from the pit of hell we cannot allow People to come into our lives and tell us that we've got to think like the world thinks. That we've got to wear clothes like the world wears clothes. Like we've got to look like the world in order to make it in the world. The Bible says that he was in the world and the world knew him not. But as many as, as them that believed on him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God. That is our promise. That is our heritage. That is who we are. Don't let the world tell you you are anything else than who God told you you were from the beginning. From the beginning of our walk with God, he told us that we were more than conquerors. He told us that when we are born again, John said it like this. He said, when you're born again, you're born again an overcomer and let not the world tell you otherwise. They've hijacked the word love, and I can get myself in a lot of trouble because this is going on social media, but they hijacked the word love, and now it's a part of the LGBTQ community. All the while, the church stands back and hides in the corner. We cannot do this anymore. We cannot win with weakness. We have to show ourselves strong. We have to lift up the voice of dissent in this world and say, there's still a church here in Barstow. There's still a church in California that has not bowed down to the image. Not bowed down to what the world wants us to bow down to or be a part of the way that the image of the world is. There was a king in the time of, um, I believe it was King Obed, for Jerusalem, there was a king, and, and, and he wrote on, on some walls that he had created. He built the biggest city that, that, that they knew about, like that they had ever seen in that time. And on that, he said, this city that I built will last forever and ever. 
And on the walls of that city, he talked about all his conquests and how he beat the Jews and, and, and how he took all, took all their stuff and everything. Well, today you can find those words on an archaeological dig of a broken down city. What this world seeks to build up for an eternity, to make you seem like this is going to last forever, it only lasts for a moment. The Greeks were the strongest. They were the most powerful. United States was the strongest. And United States was the most powerful. But I go to briefings all the time where we're talking about how we're scared to death of China. I'm being real with you. Scared to death of China. They've surpassed us in technology. They've surpassed us in strength. They've surpassed us in masculinity. While we hate ourselves and while we tell our, our, our young men that they have toxic masculinity, they're teaching the opposite in their schools and they are winning. We don't know how we're going to defeat them. We know that that's our number one struggle. And I'm sorry I'm talking little politics here, but we, we know that that's our number one struggle. And yet now we're every bit of, of, of effort that we are putting into the military today is about inclusion. Is it about, you know, this, this hijacking of the word love and tolerance and everything. Tolerance has made it to where you cannot believe in anything because 20 years from now your beliefs are going to get you canceled. We cannot be scared of these things. The Jews that believed on Christ, they were ridiculed to the point that the prophet, to the point that Peter the apostle was scared to fellowship with Gentiles when the Jews came to visit. How easy it is. The Bible tells us, Paul admonishing um, Timothy tells him, be careful. You know, we know that it, even though we are children of God, we are Always on the precipice of a great fall. The moment we begin to think of ourselves more highly than we ought. He specifically said, Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. But the Holy Spirit explicitly and unmistakably declares that in the latter times, some will turn away from the faith. That's not people living in the world turning away from the faith. That's people that are in the faith turning away from the faith. Paying attention instead to deceitful and seductive spirits and doctrines of demons. We are in a fight for our minds every day. We are in a fight for our souls and our eternity every day when we wake up. There should be adrenaline flowing through our veins when we wake up knowing what we are about to encounter for the day. If it were told to you right now that there were guns and there were all kinds of ammunition... On the other side of this wall when you walk out of this house and you were on God's side and you were, and you were the one going to fight against that enemy, adrenaline would start pumping through your veins and you would begin to start working yourself up and you would begin to say, hoorah, let's go get them. You would begin to say it because there is no such thing as defeat when all you have is the ground that you can gain before you. We cannot be passive. We cannot stand aside while the world runs rampant within the church. It's not like it's without the walls. And that's why I love what the Bible says about the youth in the church. It is so important. The Bible says that they will speak to the enemy. Not just when the enemy's outside the gates. But he said that, he said, blessed is the man who has a quiver full of young people. Because they had the boldness to speak to the enemy when the enemy is inside the gates. When the enemy is inside the walls and he's encroaching upon families. And he's encroaching upon what makes you a man of God. And he's encroaching upon what makes you a woman of God. You've got to be willing to firmly put your feet in the floor beneath you. And say I am not moving. Because greater is what is within me than he that is in the world. And there is no weapon young people. There is no weapon that is formed against you that can prosper. This is not something that is un that that, is, that, is, that is, this is not something that I'm just saying that has never been tried, never been proven before. Generation after generation speaks out as a witness against us. When we fall back instead of move forward. When we wake up in the morning and adrenaline is not pumping through our veins because we are going to encounter a real spiritual enemy. 
scarier than what you can see is that which you cannot see working in the shadows and in the day and in the night claiming ground too often in our minds we've got to stop and say enough enough is enough I will hear Young people, we've got to say when Jeremiah the prophet is crying out to us thousands of years ago, we've got to say, I will hear. I will walk in that thing. I will proclaim when the Spirit of the Lord falls upon me, this is that. It's not something about something in my imagination. It's not a hype. It's not the adrenaline going through my veins. But it's the Spirit of God moving upon me in a season where I can find Him and He has already found me. This thing is real. It never says you shall receive weakness. It says you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you're going to witness. That means that you've seen something. That means that you've experienced something. And instead of saying silent, you're going to run around and you're going to say, hey, there's another way. There's another way of life. And it is life more abundantly than this world has to offer. And when you write... Upon the walls of his kingdom, this will not pass away. It will not pass away. It's already written. The important thing is that it's written in the tables of our hearts. There's never been a greater need in the church than a Christian warfare cry. Who will I send the, through the ages of history is being propelled generation after generation and who is going to answer the call? We've got to answer the call. It is truth and knowledge of the truth that transforms us and belief in the truth that transforms us into the children of God. When we go out on the battlefield, it should not be a fair fight for the enemy. Though he come with numbers untold and unseen, he cannot stand up against one child of God. Not one. He'll come before you one way and flee seven ways and he won't come again for a long, long time. We've got to take authority over the confusion that is bombarding us each and every day. We've got to say no more ground will I concede, but today I'm waking up. Today I am a child of God. Yesterday I was a child of God, but maybe I didn't act like it. But today I'm a child of God and I'm here to fight. In Jeremiah's times, the ancient paths were the law of Moses, but the Bible says that the law of Moses was nailed on a cross. And the power and the things that we fight for and the paths that we walk day in and day out are in Christ Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. What that verse means is that because Jesus did it, you and I can do it too. A preacher ridiculed in Alabama by some non-believer. They said to him, they said, how do you believe that you can be perfect all the time? And he says, you're wrong. I don't believe that I can be perfect all the time. And he said, then why do you act and why do you do what you do? And he said, do you believe that I can go one minute without sinning? And he said, yeah, the unbeliever. He said, you think I can go an hour without sinning? Yeah. Do you think I can go one day, one day without sinning? And the unbeliever said, maybe. And the preacher looked at him and said, I'll take it one day at a time. It's not about how hard we fall. It's not about when we fall. It's about the spirit inside of us that says, get back up. You're a fighter. You're a victor. You're an overcomer. Get back up again and fight. We got to know where 
the Jews went wrong in, Je in Jeremiah's day. First thing is, they closed their ears to the word of God. To whom shall I speak, the Bible says, and give warning that they may hear. Behold, their ears are closed and they cannot listen. Behold, the word of the Lord has become an offense to them and they have no delight in it. Jesus said, who has an ear? Let him hear what the Spirit of God is speaking to the church. Sadly, too many times they don't want to listen. But if we're true to ourselves right now, we will say and concede that we don't always listen. That we hear sometimes what happens over the pulpit and it seems like an unachievable goal to go out in this world and live by what is preached, but it is achievable and the devil is a liar. We are winners. We are not in defeat and we don't act like it. They want to have their ears tickled and listen to a message of their choosing since they have no delight in the word of God. This is what happened to Jerusalem in Jeremiah's day. And there are parallels throughout the church. There are parallels without the church right now. Today in our day where the spirit of God is still speaking to us firmly and loudly from the Old Testament and from Jeremiah's failed ministry. Yet we are often not willing to listen to God's word. But the Bible says we cannot be saved without hearing the word. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing the words of God. Another thing that they did in error was that they obeyed and followed what was popular. Skinny jeans are popular but they're not of the God. And they're not from the church. And I'm saying that because he said it. I wouldn't say it otherwise. There is a meddling spirit, Pastor. But there are some standards out there, young men and women and saints of the church, where we have drawn the line and said, we will not cross this line. We will not cross this line. They followed what was popular. The Bible says from far or from the least of them, even to the greatest among them, everyone was greedy for gain. And from the prophet, even to the priest, everyone dealt falsely. The prophets and the priests were greedy for gain. Micah described their mentality as saying this, the leaders pronounce judgment for a bribe, and her priest instructs for a price, and her prophets divine for money. The greater pale of Christendom, you can't turn on TBN without hearing somebody ask you for money so they can put more gold on their fixtures so that they can have more and more mammon to worship in lieu of God. We live in a world that is following and showing forth what is popular and in the greater pale of Christianity it is known even there. How can religious teachers and leaders guarantee their own monetary gain? They deliver the message that pleases the people. We should never want a message coming from behind this pulpit that pleases our ears. Amen. Our amen should be with conviction. Not thinking of ourselves more highly than we ought because we know that at any moment we can fall. This world, we've got to respect the enemy and the great deceiver that he is. Too many people, when they encounter a difficult statement in God's word, they will abandon it. This is, even happened when Jesus was on, on earth. The Bible says that as he taught, the result was many of his disciples withdrew from him and stopped walking. They looked at him who spoke truth. They, his, his true disciples said, where shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. The word of eternal life was in front of them speaking life and disciples were offended and they left men that walked with him until the road got a little too hot and a little too long and they were offended we cannot allow offenses to 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 combat our relationship with God because if we do we'll find ourselves very quickly following what is popular with itching ears 
Another thing that they did was that they began to ignore sin. How many times have we looked up in our houses and and looked up in our lives and saw that we are so far away from where we began. And we've allowed sin to encroach so much in our lives and in our kids' lives. And we look back and we say, what happened? And the remedy for this is to ask, where are the ancient past, Pastor? And not just listen to him because he's telling you something, but the Bible says, see, look for yourself. And ask, where's the ancient paths? They're not in what mom and dad did. They're not in what they did generations ago. But whatever the mind of Christ is and was, that is the ancient paths. That is the good way. The Bible says, be not trans or be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good way. That good and acceptable and perfect will of God in your life. We cannot any longer ignore sin. And we've got to with open eyes see the paths that we are walking day in and day out. And say wow I've strayed a little too far away from the good path. I've strayed a little too far away from what the preacher was talking about on Thursday. When the preacher was talking about on Sunday. And we've got to course correct. The word sin is to miss the mark. And the only way that you miss the mark is by just the slightest degree. Just the slightest degree of turn from the old paths. From the ancient way. From the way of God. We'll find ourselves ignoring sin, following what is popular. We'll find ourselves with closed ears to the word of God. Because we have loved the world and the things inside of the world. It will desensitize us to the word and we've got to open our eyes if they are not open already. And one of the worst things that they did and it is the, it is the, the sum of, of, of all of these things that we've already talked about is what it produces. They lost their sense of shame. The reason why women can walk around half naked is because they've lost their sense of shame. The reason why men can wear such tight pants that you can see Abraham Lincoln's face and the penny in their back pocket, that is because they've lost shame. Come on, come on. We cannot lose our sense of shame. The Bible says that there are seraphim that, that surround the holy of holies, the, 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 the holiest one, and the Bible says that they cover their face with some of their wings because of the reverence that they have for God. We cannot get too familiar with God that we think that we're on the same level. It's an easy thing to get to. It's an easy thing to walk into a church that's been sanctified by prayer. It's easy to walk into a place where the preacher's been fasting and has a word for God and for us to get tickled ears and for us to say no that hurts a little bit too much and get offended and walk away I don't want to get too far into this but the Bible says hath not woman power over her head because the angels it's given to her for a covering for a reverence for a respect to her head and the head of every man is Christ And the head of Christ is God. We cannot be weak men. I look around here and I see more women than I see men. And that is the effect of the enemy's attacks on man. If any man prays or prophesies having his head covered, it is a shame unto him. We've lost our sense of shame. And so when we find ourselves... Walking and veering off the path, we find ourselves desensitized to the conviction of the Holy Ghost. It's such an easy thing. I'm not saying this is happening in your life. I'm saying that it can very easily happen. And we've got to be attuned to what thus saith the the word of God. He said that he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit of God says. And the Spirit of God is speaking tonight. The ancient paths. It's not just the Old Testament. It's not just... Anything done in the past, it's, it's what Jesus did in the face of persecution. It's when they said, we're going to beat you, he took steps forward. It's when the Roman guard lifted up that hammer and he willingly gave out his hand and said, do what you will to me, what I have is truth. 
It's, it needs to get ingrained within us and something needs to happen inside of us to say when I go to the workplace, do what you will to me. I've got the truth. I can't create this truth. I didn't make this thing up. This is something that was delivered when holy men of God, when holy men of God spoke and wrote it down. The ancient paths. Not what previous generations have done because in every previous generation there was a mistake, there was a flaw and God is asking us to improve upon that which went before us. That's why he said in the last days it's not just going to be the former rain. If it was just a former rain we would have or should have depression in this place because it wasn't the former end that got us to the finish line. It's the former and it's the latter rain together. I don't know about you, but I want to be dancing in the rain. I want to show myself strong in the rain. I want to say I'm not backing down. I don't care what CNN says. I don't care what MSNBC says. I don't care what Fox News Channel says. I will not go any farther than where I am meant to be. The ancient past, and I close it. We'd all stand tonight. Jesus never meant for his church to be weak, but he said, I will build my church upon a rock, and the gates of hell will rattle as it will, but it will not stand or prevail against the church. Yes. Yes. Jesus brought his disciples to a land called Caesarea Philippi. brought his disciples into downtown LA where all the gangs are where all the people are that are refusing God and the fool has said in his heart no God there is no God they're all around the disciples as he brings us to this brings him to that place this was the factory for idols and in fact just beyond where they stood on a mountaintop and Jesus had this conversation with his disciples, just beyond that was a, was a cave, a grotto. And the people in that day had superstition that that was the very gates of hell. They worshipped the pan god and they believed that that's where he dwelt and that's where hell was. Jesus didn't bring them into a church pastor where they can scream and shout and holler and profess who God is. He didn't bring them to a safe place where he can say God is real and I've got the truth and it's the Christ is the son of the living God. He didn't bring them to a place like that but he brought them to the dirtiest place. He brought them to the place where if they spoke loud enough maybe they could get shot. Maybe they can be killed for their belief. And they said, some say you're John the Baptist or, or John, or, or, or and some say you're that prophet. Some say you're this, some say you're that. And Peter stood up among them and said, you are the Christ, the son of God. That's right. And he said, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. You look across this mountain right over here and the gates of hell are not going to prevail against that truth. Those gangs are not going to prevail against the truth. The mob is not going to prevail against the truth. The people who are seeking to cancel you, they're not going to prevail. I feel an urgent need to pray in this place tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you in your name. In the name of Jesus Christ, whereby every knee will bow and every tongue will confess truth. That you are Lord of all. And your enemies will become your footstool, Lord. And we will stand beside you, behind you, Lord God. And we will shout, great is our God. Who has caused us to triumph over every enemy, over every attack. He has brought to our attention that the world that we live in is not a world that we are from. Or a world that we will stay my God, help us tomorrow to renew faith and have a little bit more adrenaline going through our veins as we meet the enemy with fervor and strength and power. Exploding into rivers of joy and laughter.
victor in the face of the enemy with increasing numbers and overwhelming odds. We thank you, God. You could have could have put Paul in this moment you could have put Peter in this moment but you put me in this moment you put every saint in this church in this moment to overcome the greatest attacks of the enemy this world has ever seen and we believe that you are faithful and that you have not left us and you will not forsake us and we believe in your truth and that it will last in eternity heaven and earth will pass away and all therein that do not believe in Christ but your words and your truth, they are eternal, forever settled in heaven where we will reside if we stay the course and we stay close to our pastor, the man of God that you have placed in our lives. Help us, Lord Jesus, to lift him up even as the table of showbread lifts up that word and lifts up that bread of life. Help us, Lord, to fortify his members, oh God. Give us a burden and a passion to pray for the ministry without ceasing in a world that is not ceasing to be evil. We must not, we must not, we must not stop, Lord. I can't make it on my own, Lord. We cannot make it and with our legs and with our power, but God, all things are possible. We are people of the name. We have not forsaken your name. The calling upon it, oh God, we proclaim it, Lord, when we eat. We proclaim it before we sleep. We proclaim it all the day. We are people of your name. And we believe in renewed power in the church today, right now. God, we believe that your spirit is going to move in this place like it hasn't in a long time. And God, we believe that you're going to strengthen and restore and renew and make new, Lord God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. The spirit of the Lord is in this place, church. Will you hear? The Spirit of the Lord is in this place asking you to walk. Will you walk? Will you take some time out of your busy schedule to know the Lord? Hallelujah! Hallelujah! 